Yes, yeah, so you've been the guy behind a lot of great successes. Uh, I, I don't know how familiar everyone here is with your career, but obviously ICQ was one of the first great successes of the internet era. Uh, but you've gone on to really become the, the uh, godfather, if you like, of, of the high-tech industry in Israel, which is one of the most dynamic startup environments in the world. And you've had a big part in it. Can you tell us what's your secret? What's my secret? Eh. My secret is, first of all, uh, luck. <laughs> That's a very important uh, thing. And uh, maybe, maybe doing, doing, doing the right things. You know, you, your, th your, your talk really, I think, inspired all of us to, to think a lot. The most interesting point of the many interesting point is this Pascal wager. Yeah. That at the end of the day, I think that if you do the correct things, if you do the correct things, it will come back to you many times. Yeah. It's not about technology. It's about doing the correct thing. If you do the correct thing, if you develop reputation, if you deal with young people with dignity, if you deal with them honestly, it will come it will come back to you. I think that this, this was a big part of, of why I was able to associate myself with a lot of young people and deliberating on this motive. You know, again, this, is, uh, this, this thought came to me after you, you talked. This is not what I planned to, to speak yeah. about. But two years ago, I was approached by a guy and he told me he has some idea for collaborative tool, and I was not certain if it's good or not. At the end, I asked him, tell me, what are you, are you doing anything voluntarily? He said, yes, there is a school of kids which need help, and I go there and I help uh, the school. I said, okay, I will invest with you. After we became a little bit more friendly, he asked me what the fact that I'm volunteering, volunteering has to do with your, with your uh, investment criteria. So I told him, look, we, the angels, the VCs, we're trying to pretend that we know a lot and we make rational decisions. At the end of the day, we don't know anything. You know, we, we know a little bit. And if you lose, I always tell my wife, my wife always tell me, it it's, doesn't make a sense that when a kid with big eyes, little eyes, come to your home, he walks away with a check. She said, this is not a good, uh, a good <laughs> business. So I told her, look, we were very fortunate in the past, so consider it as if we are giving young guy a scholarship to go and exercise his dream. But who wants, so if we lose the money, I told her, this is a scholarship. And we give this kind of scholarship every time, because you don't want to think about yourself that you are an idiot. So when you lose the money, you say, I'm not an idiot, I gave a scholarship to something. But who wants to give scholarship to, to jerks? You want to give scholarship to nice people. <laughs> so one of the criteria of my uh, investment is that I like to associate myself with, with people which are nice in, in the term of, of being wholesome, wholesome people, you know, not only yeah. great Can technicians. Can you talk about some of your other investment criteria? Yes, uh, I think that uh, my sweet spot, my sweet spot, is to try to find young people who are very enthusiastic about what they are doing. Uh, I would like usually to invest in consumer-facing uh, internet or, or uh, mobile application. I'm not very much interested in infrastructure, in enterprise, etc., which are great things, but... It's not I your am, sweet spot, yeah. It's, I, I'm much more attracted by, by creating great experiences. I, I want them to be focused. I want them to be nimble. I want them to be nice guys. And I want them to be very talented. They have to be, if, 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 if I'm being told that a kid is very talented, I am obsessed to get uh, in partnership with him because great experiences through history are being created by very talented people. The technology today is only the substrate. The technology yeah. is like the canvas. What you need, you need the talent. So I want to just talk about sort of entrepreneurial culture. I, I just came from Spain where I spoke at an open source conference yesterday. And what was really interesting there 
uh, it was government-sponsored conference, and clearly they, they really are trying to encourage a technology culture. And yet, as I talked to uh, various attendees, uh, I got the sense, for example, the, the woman who was translating for me said, you know, there's a real stigma there to failure. There's a real stigma. She says, I, you know, I, I don't really like my job, but I can't change because then it'll be on my resume that I didn't, you know, I was only in my job for two years. You know, and, you know, just the, this sort of sense that, that um, being an entrepreneur was, was frowned on there. And, you know, clearly in Israel it's, it's not. And, uh, you know, I think in some countries in Europe here are much more entrepreneurial than others. Uh, what are some of the key elements of entrepreneurial culture, do you think? Yeah, okay. First of all, I, I agree with you that entrepreneurship is a culture. Again, it's not technology. The technology mm -hmm. is needed, but it's about the culture. And you need, you need a number of parameters. First of all, it's very helpful if you have a Jewish mother. Because if you have a Jewish mother, she will push you to, to accomplish. You know, it's like when, when if you become a pianist, you need a pushy, a pushy mother. My mother always told me and my brother that we are idiots compared to our cousins who are very smart, and she always complained why they are very smart, and she is the only unfortunate uh, person who has such idiots as their <laughs> sons. Yeah. And yeah. though she maybe she finished maybe eight, eight grades, she understood, she had a deep understanding of genetic engineering because she also provided the explanation, she, say, she said, your cousins are smarter than you because they are not contaminated with the genes of your father. Yeah. So, <laughs> so, um, <laughs> so I remember you uh, actually uh, telling Sergey Brin uh, something that you thought his mother would probably tell him. Do you remember that conversation? Yeah. <laughs> allegedly, allegedly, the, this is according to a writer who wrote a book about, about Google. Allegedly, she told him, uh, Google schmoogle. Sergey must finish PhD, and honorary degree doesn't count. He has to write a thesis and protect it. <laughs> so one thing is you need, you need to come from a culture, from a home culture, which really revere, revere, uh, revere uh, entrepreneurship. You know, I spoke with a Spanish friend of mine, and he told me the biggest enemy of entrepreneurship in Spain is the famous saying, that a Spanish mother will tell her son, can't you have a real job? Yeah. So a real job is a job in the government or in the bank or something like this. Second, yeah. you need this, yeah. this tolerance for, for uh, risk. For risk, and I would add to your very wonderful quote, another very known quote, and this is the, what uh, your great president Teddy Roosevelt said in his famous speech, the man in the arena, where, which he gave in 1910 in France, in the Sorbonne, when he went to get the Nobel Prize in, uh, on the way to get the Nobel Prize in Stockholm in 1910, he said the, the recognition and the glory should go to the man in the arena, whether he succeed or he fail. Even if he's lying on the ground smeared with blood and dust, at least he attempted to do something great and not and the credit shouldn't go to the people who are sitting with frozen face around yeah. the arena. He didn't speak about VCs and investments, but uh, yeah. it was, it was uh, also celebra not celebrating, but advocating the value of uh, the virtue of failure. Let's talk a little bit about um, being an entrepreneur without a VC, you know, or without a lot of money. You know, we, we, we've been in a time when uh, certainly startups are leaner today than they were. Uh, you know, back in the first dot-com uh, boom. But still, there's this idea that you can only, you know, people, at least when I've been being interviewed by people, it's sort of this assumption that, you know, you can't be a, a startup without having a, you know, a VC to fund you. And, you know, I, I said, well, gosh, I started O'Reilly with $500, so, uh, you know, and I never took a, <laughs> took a dime from anybody. You know, and so, I'm sure you've seen some of those pretty yeah, lightly funded I, startups. I started my first uh, software company, which was a software enterprise in 1969, with $5,000 and a few of my friends, which were very capable, and it, for a period in the 70s, it became the largest software company in Israel. It was really bootstrapping. Bootstrapping is an art which like went away, and this is very unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, it's true that if you are going to create a fab, you cannot do it with $500. Yeah. Or if you are going to create infrastructure, or even 
I found if you are going into enterprise software because you need the marketing, and the marketing is very yeah. expensive. But the beauty of the web is that today you can take elements like Lego, and with the APIs, you can assemble together terrific, terrific products in, in less than $100,000. And I think that what we learned from the experiments about fruit flies and mice, that if you love them, you, st you starve them, also apply in some of these companies. The companies which will survive the current problem are the companies which learn how to use money efficiently and not to, yeah. to spend it. So it depends on which type of, uh, of Yeah, so I think it could be a very, very instructive period where we may get some much healthier startups. And I certainly look at the, you know, again, the, the dot-com bust. Uh, many of the, the Web 2.0 darlings actually really started after that period. You know, even a company like Google was started in an area where uh, nobody thought there was much uh, investment opportunity. It was just, you know, they, they, they had a big idea. Yeah, I, I, I can tell you one thing which I remember very vividly, you know, the, 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 the internet, the, the, the bubble busted, Wall Street wrote off the internet. People say the internet was a phenomena it's, uh, it's over. Nobody was willing to touch uh, a web, uh, a, a com company. They used to call it dot com at that time with a 10 feet pole. And yet in ICQ, we saw that day in, day out, 80,000 new users came and registered to the product. That's small numbers today, though. You know? <laughs> 80,000 a day, it's still not uh, small. You know, by now, I think there, there were like 400 million people who downloaded. Yeah. The, not 80,000 visitors, 80,000 new users who downloaded yeah. the program. And we realized at that time that either the users are not reading Wall Street Journal or, or, Wall, Street jo uh, or Wall Street doesn't read the users. So there was a big discontent, and I guarantee you that the internet will continue in spite of all no, abso the... Absolutely. I, mean, I don't think anybody today uh, doubts Yeah, it. I think, you know, kind of going back to what I said earlier, I, I, I certainly think that the, the deep trends that, you know, are, are, that I've called Web 2.0 are, are, are far bigger than any individual startup or cloud of startups, and, and there's a lot of opportunity in yeah. this space. I, I, think, I think that the whole, the whole the, the, the thing we saw on the internet is just was a reflection to human nature, which is much deeper than just the internet. The, the collaboration, the open, the open source, the, the open community, the bottom-up creation of things, started in the internet because it was the easiest way to start it. But as you know the story very well, as I experienced it for the first time in your full camp, you definitely can move it uh, to the real world. You can, mm -hmm. you can move these attitudes to the real world and you can create fantastic, efficient, wonderful uh, new, new ways of people to collaborate and to work yeah. with each other. By the way, do we have any provision for questions from the audience here? No, no mics? Uh, yeah, if, if, do we want to take questions from the audience? Sure, yeah. why not? So maybe just speak, if, if people want to uh, ask questions, stand up, speak loudly, and we'll do our best to repeat the questions. Stand up and scream. Yeah, I just, I, as somebody was commenting uh, about this uh, conference I was at in, in Malaga, you know, how, you know, just what a shame it was there wasn't much, any opportunity for audience interaction. Hey in guys, what's going on with, yeah, very good. Can you, can you present yourself? Can you introduce yourself? My name is Sarek from Celity. Sarek from Celity. My question is, would you recommend the new startups to ignore VCs? No, I, I think, uh, who am I, you know, to ignore VCs? You know, some of my best friends are VCs, as they say. <laughs> I think, I think that uh, it depends on the, on the ambition, it depends on the pattern, it depends on the, on the thing. I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't recommend uh, to ignore VCs. I would recommend even for certain companies to join VCs. The only thing which I will say, check, check the VC. Check if entrepreneurs who worked with him 10 years ago are coming again to work with him. Check how he treats the people. If he treats the people nice, if the, his former entrepreneurs yeah are coming again, by all means, go to it. You know, there's a great story that I, I, I learned. I hadn't realized this originally. Um, you know, Index Ventures was an investor in, in uh, MySQL. I was on the board of MySQL. 
Uh, but I had, didn't hear until uh, my school was bought by Sun the story of how Danny became an investor. Uh, he had wanted to be an investor early on, uh, and my school had gone with someone else. Uh, but Danny was, said, I love these guys, I love this project, and he continued to be helpful to them. And then uh, one of the early investors actually was in a, you know, for those of you who aren't familiar with VC funds, they actually have a time limit on the partnership. And one of the very early investors, their partnership was dissolving and they actually had to sell their shares. And, and so they, they brought uh, Index in, and of course it became a great success, along with Skype, obviously, uh, you know, for the fund. But it really goes to show that, you know, and there were some other VCs who, when MySQL turned them down, just sort of were then very snooty to them because, hey, they hadn't taken their money. And, whereas Danny kept uh, being super helpful yeah. because he loved the company, he loved the idea. And I think it's a, a two-way street. You know, the, the conversation between a VC and an investor should be a conversation where you both, you have the fire about w what it is you're trying to accomplish and it really matters to you and you believe in it. Uh, you know, but I do think that there's a difference in a period where VC money is easy and everybody's playing the game because they, 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 you know, they're focused on the financial outcome, you know, versus kind of a VC period in which people are really saying, hey, I have a real business in mind. I want to build this business and one of the inputs that I need is some money. You know, that's a different scenario than, hey, place a bet with me, you know. And, and you know, we certainly have been in a bit of a gambling phase. Uh, it's it's like in any industry. Look, the VCs together with Stanford University, yeah. or the graduate of Stanford University, started one of the biggest and most important phenomena of the 20th century. The whole, the whole semiconductor industry wouldn't be without them, probably the PC, etc. When it succeeded, yeah. A lot of people moved into this uh, space, like a lot of people became mm -hmm. angels all of the, yeah. all of the sudden. The prime, the prime Minister of Italy once said that it's very unfortunate that the only people who really understand finance in Italy are the taxi drivers. So <laughs> this is true not only in, uh, yeah. in Italy and not only relating to... Yeah, do we have any, any other questions from the audience? Just feel free to any, yeah, go, go ahead over here. Are you a taxi driver? <laughs> do, you, do you understand finance? <coughs> yeah. No question. Yeah. What about the company growth from startup and the volume of companies? Is it true that at some point it's difficult to keep focus and maybe the energy to do? Do we have any magic recipe for that? Yeah, I have, I have a very magic uh, recipe. No, no, is there a magic recipe as companies grow? That's the question for how no, do you keep, keep focus. How to keep focus? The company yeah. or, the, or the investor? Company. Ah, the company. No, I cannot talk from the point of view of company. I can talk from the point of view of the investor. From the point of view of the investor, I have to tell you that five years ago, when I made the honest, decent accounting, I came to the conclusion that by getting involved with the life of the company on a daily basis, sometimes I bring a lot of value, and sometimes I create huge damage. And I'm not sure if the value is bigger or the, or the damage is bigger. So the investor, I'm not sure that the, the, the investor should keep focus on the growth of the companies. Maybe selecting good people and let them work yeah. is not a bad policy. I'll make a comment about focus uh, just from my experience at O'Reilly. And that is an interesting, it, it's, it's really easy to get trapped into focusing on an, an idea that you have formulated about what your business is. And the real secret of focus is to focus on what's the real driver of your business. And that doesn't mean you know what it is. You know, I look at my history at O'Reilly and I didn't really have this clear idea. You know, my original business yeah. plan was literally, I wrote it down as interesting work for interesting people. You know? That's a good one. And, uh, you know, and we started out a tech writing consulting company and then we got into publishing books and then we got into doing conferences and online publishing. And, you know, you go, well, seems very unfocused. And yet, at some point, it was actually after I read that book, Built to Last, I said, well, all these things had something in common. 
And I wrote down then, after, only after having been doing the company for 15 years, that I finally understood what tied all the things we did together. And I wrote down, changing the world by spreading the knowledge of innovators. And I understood that I had actually been focusing on the same thing all those years. Uh, it just, at one point, I did it through books. Another time, I did it through conferences. And, and, and now I'm doing it through investing as well. Uh, so I just would urge you, when you think about focus, to focus, you know, almost as they say, with soft eyes. You know, if you're a bird watcher, you go out there and you, you know, you're not laser focused. You're actually paying attention broadly. And, uh, you know, and you're listening to, you know, what you really believe in and what really matters. And, and it sometimes will take you in slightly different directions than you thought. Uh, and, and, and I think to keeping your whole company focused, there's a lot of the art to it is, is articulating a vision. You know, articulating a vision uh, that you really believe in, uh, and then other people come to believe in it too. And then that keeps everybody on the same track. When I was a kid, one of the best movies I saw, I don't know if they still show it, uh, 80 Days Around the World. Anybody saw this movie? Yeah. Who saw the movie? Raise your hand. Well, it depends which version. Whatever version. <laughs> Who didn't, yeah, who didn't see the movie? <laughs> so about half of the audience are deaf, yeah, yeah. or they don't understand my accent. <laughs> ne nevertheless, if you remember, this uh, guy had the plan to go around the world and see what happened to him yeah, yeah. while he was going. He was changing it all the time, and this is a company, you know, a business plan is the most ridiculous document. It uh, should, be, should be placed in sub-genre of science fiction. Because, <laughs> because, because a business plan is like you make a huge deliberation about going from here to China, whether you start in Berlin or you start in Munich. After two days, it doesn't make any, any <laughs> yeah. difference anyhow. So yeah. the conclusion is that business plan and sausage have one thing in common, that only people who don't know how they're being made are willing to eat them. <coughs> <laughs> oh. Over here. The question is, when is it a good time for a Web 2.0 company to go from free to paid? And I, 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 maybe you have a different answer, Yossi, but uh, it seems to me that um, it, it, you have to really understand the dynamics. Free works if you can reach millions of people. Uh, uh, you know, and if, if you can't reach millions of people, it's very difficult to make a business of free. Or, or, or you can do something like we've done here. A great example of this is uh, uh, you know, about a million people have read my, my What is Web 2.0 paper, which I put on the web for free. Uh, a few, you know, uh, thousands have paid, you know, a fairly large sum of money to come to one of my Web 2.0 events. That's both free and paid. And I think there's, there, there are a lot of interesting models where you actually use free to spread the word and then you monetize through something yeah. else. Um, but I, I think you really, Paid is, is under, undervalued in today's market. Everybody has this vision that they'll reach tens of millions of people and be able to build a, a free-based business model. And I think we're going to see a resurgence of real paid business models again uh, because people realize that not everyone is going to get those millions of users and make free work. And so I would definitely, in, in looking at your, your business, evaluate, uh, are people willing to pay me for it? And I tell you, that's a great test for a business, particularly in a, in, a, in a down market like this, because if you can get somebody to pay you for something, that means it's really valuable and that you're serving uh, you know, a need for them. And it, it's, um, you know, it's a good test. So I would, I would maybe do that switch yeah. now. Let me, let me add a few words. First of all, you have to remember that the user on the internet is like the electron. You know, the electron is a particle and it's a wave. The user is also particle and wave. The user is your consumer, is your end consumer, but he's also your distributor. He's the guy who do the viral work. And if you can't get the user to do your viral 
promotion, you not only save tons of money, but you create much bigger <coughs> phenomena. Fred Wilson called this model freemium, which means you give 80% of the features free, yep. and you use it uh, to, get, uh, to get part of it. Usually the part will be maybe 1%, 2%. For money. From my experience, I can tell you, free is beautiful. In the last 10 years, I was lucky to hit on three, three or four free big product. One is ICQ, which got like 400 million users. The other one is Speedbit, where we have 160 million users. The third one is something that you didn't hear, and I will do here a shameless promotion of 20 seconds. is a product that I was the a founding investor called Fring, which became the biggest phenomena of mobile IM VoIP uh, social application on, on mobile. You go to Google Trend and you see it, and we got now 3 million <laughs> users. And, uh, uh, can you spell that out? Pardon? Uh, what's it called? F-R-I-N-G. We Fring. just, we Fring. just, okay. okay. Yeah. And the other one, which I was in the, in the cradle of it, was Answers.com. It's a terrific experience. It's a terrific experience. It's also create, uh, create uh, value. I was asked once when we tried to sell ICQ, what is the business model? And I didn't have a good explanation. So I said, revenue is destruction. And when I said it, everybody stood up and applauded. It was in PC <laughs> forum. And then I arrived on a good business model. In free, it cannot be completely free. You need one customer who will buy the company. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> okay, I think we're going to have to wrap with that. Thank you very, very much, Yossi. It's always a pleasure to talk with you. And thanks so much for coming here uh, you know, from Israel. I understand no, you're just here for the day. By all means, and again, uh, I, I, I must say, Tim, I think that you're your, uh, your uh, presentation really inspired all of us to go home and to think about the, the meaning of what we are doing. And I'm not sure we will go with such great feelings, you know, so uh, all right, well, thank you very much. Well, thank you.